Greetings class and welcome to another installation here in the uh, uh, teaching second language uh, emphasis on uh, language arts. This, uh, my name is Dr. Frank Tuzzi. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, teaching writings and some of the philosophies involved and some of the processes and components. Um, most of this is uh, not in any of the texts that we were using uh, previously, so you may want to take notes here. First of all, let me just run through a bunch of quotes that I happen to run across about the whole idea of writing. Let's begin here at the top here. Uh, the role of a writer is not to say what we all can say, but what we are unable to say. It's interesting that the writers that have the interesting comments, the writers that have things that pique our curiosity are those that can say things in such a way that we're like, ah, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so that's the mark of a good writer. Next one here. Writing is a socially acceptable form of schizophrenia. For those of you who, that have ever gone through writing, there are times where you're very frustrated and you start thinking like others and you, you just get that mental anguish that you're trying to get. Um, this reminds me of the movie um, The Shining, which is a, a pretty uh, freaky movie, but it's about a guy who gets writer's block and uh, what happens because he gets it. Um, so writing can do that to you. A word is not the same with one writer as with another. One tears it from his guts, and the other one pulls it out of his overcoat. Uh, all this to say um, that there are those who put a lot of meaning and feeling and uh, emphasis into words, and those that do it rather glibly and not uh, with much thought or with much difficulty. Um, so it is different the way people write and, uh, and the meanings that they put into it. Ink and paper are sometimes passionate lovers, oftentimes brothers and sisters, and occasionally mortal enemies. Uh, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I'm writing and everything just seems to flow. It's like, they're oh, they're just wonderful. Everything is just it's nice and easy. And then there are times where you everything you write just doesn't work, and you end up backing up and undoing and... Uh, and it's just very frustrating, and the words just do not want to come out of off of the fingertips into the into the uh, the word processor. So I completely understand what he means by this. There are times where it's just great; you've got these wonderful flow of ideas, and just you're letting it ride. And then there are other times where you're just beating up against a wall uh, in the process of writing. Next quote here: I'm not a very good writer, but I'm an excellent rewriter. And the joke here being that a good writer is one who does write and rewrite and write again and write again until he can polish that rough work into something that's very good. Um, the great Russian writer uh, Tolstoy was once quoted as saying that after he finishes writing a book and he sends it off to the publisher, he never looks at it again. And the reason why is because if he does, he'll want to revise and redo the whole thing all over again. So um, he's... <laughs> talking about basically what Mishner is doing here. Next one here. Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Okay, And here is a poet uh, who is saying, don't be blatant, don't be obvious. Uh, give me the imagery in your writing so that I can have more enjoyment in, in the imagination. Um, and it's very nice when you see that you know, the glint of broken Show me the light in the glint of broken glass, or the glint of light on a broken glass. It's a completely different image than just say the moon is shining. Playing with words so that you force people to have an image in their mind. So that's that's the fun, in my opinion, of good language writers. Uh, uh, good writers, I mean, they they uh, they have fun with the words and how they can, you know, string them together to create pictures and images and force feelings like like nobody else. I love reading Shakespeare. And, uh, and when I notice that I myself am getting frustrated or upset because, because I realize, you know, there's someone behind the door and uh, I, I'm, t I'm telling myself to the character in the book, don't open that book, don't open that door, don't open that door. And it's just words strung together. And they've done that because they've taken the time to pick the right word, right? And we'll get to that one in just a minute. Um, easy reading is damn hard writing. <laughs> I'm always impressed when I look at um, uh, sports uh, people, people who are involved in sports, and they take the sport that they're doing and they make it look effortless. Uh, one of the reasons why I will enjoy watching uh, gymnastics or um, even some even some players in football, I, I was always impressed by uh, the guys who could just jump up 
and grab a ball. It looked like they were in ballet as they were up there uh, catching this ball as they were being hit by three or four other people. And it was just this effortless uh, act, at least so it appeared, uh, making the difficult look easy. And that's what good writing does. And it's... Uh, uh, good writing makes it easy to read, but it makes it very hard to write. Have you ever tried to read a tech manual? Those are people who know very much about technology, but they stink at writing. So it's hard to read. Okay? You as a good writer want to make reading easy. All right, last one here. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Love the quote because with one word, we change the meaning. We change the imagery so greatly. We as writers, if we want to be good writers, right, if we want to teach people to be good writers, we want to encourage them to pick the right word. Um, and it's, it can, again, it's going to be a lot of fun, it can be a lot of frustration. Uh, you see there's a lot of different uh, images and ideas for what it means to be a writer or a good writer. <laughs> there are a variety of teaching philosophies. Um, even on uh, uh, college campuses, you will find uh, freshmen, you'll, you'll find composition writers that have vastly different opinions as far as what makes a good writer. Um, of course, people who teach in other uh, departments, uh, they also have different ideas of what a good writer is. They don't necessarily want to teach writing, but they want to have students who are good writers. And so, first question here is, what is writing? Um, do we view writing as a product? Uh, you know, like as in business, it's a product, we want to get it done, and we want to get this end product done, and that's all we're really concerned about. Or is it a process, where we're in the process of developing and honing and polishing an idea so that it can look beautiful, right? And we're interested in, in how we go through that process. Is writing an art, right? Is it, uh, is it some way where um, we can uh, divine it in such a way that it's beautiful? that has a beauty to it, that it has a message to it? Um, is it a science? Is it uh, some type of process that we do in order to distill and get information? Um, and uh, so there's no art involved, that we can you know, make a machine to do it. Um, is it a job? You know, just something that I do in order to, you know, in order to get a grade, something that I do in order to, you know, to get published or to, uh, you know, to get paid. Uh, what is this thing that we call writing? Uh, I would submit to you that, in a sense, all of these play a part in what writing is. Um, although I would like to say it's a process, although I would like to say it is art, um, it is also a product. It's something that eventually needs to be delivered to someone. Um, and if that product is not good enough, according to the, you know, the, the distributors, it's not going to be printed. Um, it is a process, and you can't just create something out of a cookie cutter to make uh, good writing. It does take blood, sweat, toil, and tears, to quote a, uh, my famous politician. Uh, and there is some science to it. There are components in it that uh, can be distilled into uh, basic components, but it is much more than just the science. Um, so uh, I would submit to you that all of these pieces are, in fact, parts of what we would call writing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the philosophies in just a minute here. Why do we teach writing? Uh, why would we teach writing? Well, language mastery would be one reason. Forced output production, I'm sorry, not forced, pushed output production is a great way for language learners to improve and strengthen their language capabilities because they're getting stronger with the language because we're pushing it because we're forcing them to write. So one reason is language mastery. One reason is because it's fun. Playing with words is just great fun. Uh, and if anybody knows or has ever done that with words, I mean, I mean, look at the things that we consider funny. Look at the things that we consider sad. Oftentimes, they're word-based activities. Um, and if you look at a book that you've read, look, consider a book that you've read, it's all words. Consider a movie that you've watched and you see and you get emotional about something. Oftentimes, it's because of the words that are, that are used. And to be able to play with words in such a way to have an idea or to evoke a memory or an emotion can be very, very fun. Um, another reason would be academic success. Uh, if I'm a good writer, if I know if I know the process, if I know the science of it and the art of it, I can 
uh, I can create good works and get academic success, even success in the future. Self-expression. Some people use it to um, express their feelings, their frustrations, just like people use other forms of expression, but writing can do the same thing. Um, so there are a variety of reasons why I want to teach writing, and obviously uh, for, for most ESL students, uh, it's going to be these areas that are the end things, the products, as it were. But then we also have these uh, that it's fun, that they can, they can express, especially people who come from other countries and they're here and they want to find someone to express. Learning how to write is an excellent way to, for that self-expression. Okay, so we want to teach writing. We know writing is a variety of uh, components. What's the role of the teacher? What can I do to teach writing? Now, there will be some on uh, one side who will say, you just let it flow. Don't stop, just let whatever is out there, just let those ideas just flow from you and just write. Um, and then you have the other people who say, plan, draft, revise. Um, now, I will submit to you that um, our role is to be more than just a guide and a model. Um, Peter Elbow, who is a, a great composition uh, uh, researcher, writer, um, has often talked about the need to get away from the science of writing, get away from the process of writing. I'm sorry, yeah, the, yeah, and the, and the, I'm sorry, the product of writing. We should, we should instead look for the process of writing, the art of writing. And those are the things that he would emphasize, and I wouldn't disagree with that. I do know that ESL learners need uh, structure, which means that uh, for them to begin with, they're going to need more of the product. They're going to need more of the science. I look at uh, the two basic forms for teaching someone how to play the piano. We have, the we have the traditional European method where you learn your scales and you learn your chords and, and your, um, uh, you learn how to read uh, the, uh, the time and the, and the, uh, um, the key uh, when you're learning and you, you learn those structures and after you learn those structures for a while they become second nature and you begin to get involved into the passion and the, the uh, emotion and the feelings involved. Okay, and so that's one way where you, you learn structure first and you meld into uh, the feelings and the emotions. And then you have another type of, of a piano learner uh, who just learns through that feeling. Okay, and they don't focus nearly as much on the components. Elbow would be in that vein where he wants to say, let's, let's not worry about structure. Let's not worry about the component. Let's get them to eat, sh share their emotions. And so you want to be a guide. You want to be a model. Uh, to them, but you don't want to be one who pushes um, uh, the science of writing. Most ESL students that I know need some form of that, okay? I would espouse to this idea, which I would call pointillism. If you know what pointillism in with, with, um, with art, um, they, cr they create all these little dots. They paint using all these little dots, and when you s step back and you look at it, you see the entire image, but when you look up, get real close, and you look at it, it's just a bunch of dots. And uh, what I believe with regard to writing is that there are some things that you can teach. You can teach some of the process. You can teach some of the science. You can teach some of the art. Okay? You can't teach all of it, but you can teach some of it. And those things you teach, and that gives the student a kind of a guide so that when they step back, they can they can fill in those other places, okay? And my guess is that they're going to fill in other places with this Elbowian idea of of emoting and letting it flow and letting it ride. Um, so I, I would espouse to a mixture of these two. I wouldn't want to be uh, just uh, just uh, writing freely and let it flow and don't stop to edit. Uh, but I would also want to talk about planning, drafting, and revising. I'm going to be somewhere here in the middle. Um, Letting it ride, letting it flow, I think is a great idea, provided you understand where all these pieces normally go. Okay? There was a great movie uh, director in Sweden who once said, every good movie has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and so there were structured elements, and you know where they typically belong, but after you learned the pieces, you learned how to move them or hide them or even get rid of them. 
So it is with writing, uh, I believe. There are things that I can teach them, and once they know them, then they can mess around with them. I remember, again, taking piano lessons, and I had to learn... I had to learn these dumb scales, and uh, it was was boring. It wasn't interesting. Again, Peter Elbow would uh, agree with this. But I was also told that after I learn these rules, I'm going to learn how to break them. Um, and so uh, um, I believe that they're going to need to know some of these rules, especially ESL students who need more scaffolding. But at the same time, they need to live in this world, and we want to push them over to that world as quickly as possible. We want to have that balance. We want to have uh, that pointillism. Okay, well, can we teach? I think I've answered that question. Well, we can teach some things. Uh, we should teach them, right? There are things that we can teach. Again, the teachable are these people over here, right? And the unteachable philosophies are these people over here who just say, let it ride, do what you, uh, just let it flow, and let it flow come out of you, and, and then you'll be able, you'll be able to write. Um, again, I'm going to be somewhere in the middle. We, we need some structure, and we need some some uh, free flow of ideas. Um, so I'm going to be in, in the middle there. Uh, again, there are some things we can teach. There are some things we just can't teach. And I know I've been sitting trying to sh explain to a student, you know, what this feeling is or what that process is. And, as, as, you know, although you point to it, you're, you're looking, but they just don't see it. And eventually it's just got to click where they can say, oh, okay, I get it. Um, there are some things you can teach, some things that you can't. Toosie pointillism. All right, what are some things that you can teach? Well, you can talk about what a sentence is. You can talk about a paragraph, an essay, a section, or research. All of these things in basic form, you can talk about the prototypicals of them all so that your students can understand them. Okay, and those are the basics uh, from, from uh, just uh, um, basic writing components. As far as a, a paper format, you can teach these things. You can teach what an introduction is, a body, a conclusion. Uh, and originally when you do this, you say, well, an introduction can be a sentence, and then it becomes a paragraph, and then it becomes a group of paragraphs. And the same thing with the body. It be you know, begins with a couple sentences, and then it's a couple paragraphs, and, you know, and then it can be a couple as you grow, as they learn more of the process. Right? Again, this is for academic writing. This is not for other types of writing. Other components that you can teach. You can teach them what a thesis statement is, right? The main idea of a of a paper. You can teach them what a topic sentence is, the main idea of a section or a paragraph, concluding statement. You can talk about audience. Who are you writing to, right? And what do they know? What do they need to know? You can talk about the purpose. Why are you writing this paper? You can write about the task. What's the objective of this? You can talk about a hook, okay? And a hook is basically somewhere in the introduction where you grab the reader's attention, right? You hook them in to get them to want to read the story. I am always remember about uh, uh, when I was in a, a freshman uh, composition class and um, the teacher told the story about how he gave a project out to everybody. It was the first essay they had to write, and the project was write about some characteristic of yourself, okay? Wanted to give them easy information, background information that they had so he could get a writing sample to find out where they were. Okay, I get it. One of the papers that he reads, you know, he gets this stack of 30 papers, and one of them that he reads is, uh, you know, m that um, he, one of his greatest characteristics is his gift of prevarication, which means lying, his gift of lying. And the teacher was like, whoa, and he comes back and he looks at it again. He grabbed the teacher's attention. Because normally when te students write about their characteristics, they don't write about their bad characteristics. They write about their good characteristics. And so this writer used this idea, this hook that he did, to hook the teacher in, right, to get him to want to read. <laughs> you can teach students about that. You can teach them about a thread. A thread is an idea that you weave throughout, you weave throughout a, a paper. And again, you'll see that um, in, in books and movies and in papers where they try to weave an idea throughout the paper so that it makes, uh, it makes sense as you, uh, as you go through that idea. Sometimes the idea changes, of course, um, um, so, but it's still that idea that's weaved through. You can talk about cohesive elements uh, where you talk about uh, um, you know, um, uh, logical connectors and those types of things. You talk about word choice. You talk about, you talk about having your own voice or tone or imagery. You can talk about the modes, uh, which is your more traditional, you know, your uh, your information type speech or your or not speech paper or a descriptive paper or uh, you know a uh, persuasive paper. The modes that are are normally you can teach these components. Okay. Now it's going to be a little harder to teach voice or what my voice is. 
uh, even though generically you can talk about them. But there are some things that you can teach. This is the writing process that I typically show students. You begin by brainstorming, you organize, you draft, and you revise. I also show students this is everything in life. Uh, you can brainstorm, just get a bunch of ideas. And, and it's not necessarily separated either. Sometimes these things overlap. You're brainstorming and organizing and organizing and brainstorming at the same time until you get a, a rough idea of what you want and then you begin, you begin painting. Have you ever seen the Mona Lisa? Did you know that there were a couple dozen pre-drafts uh, uh, of the one that's in the Louvre? There are sketch drawings and there are, are actually painted ones. Uh, that he did before he actually did. He went through this process. He did brainstorming and organizing. He did pilot testing. Um, so this is the writing process that I typically show students. Um, it's definitely not the only way that it could be done. Um, but if I want to try to organize my thoughts and ideas, I may want to do it this way. In this process here, most of this, this, um, this much here, is more of the structure plan. Okay, and this section here is more of the, the free flow of ideas down here, this free flow of ideas. And uh, so I try to put both of them in there, and I try to encourage them to play with, play with words and play with ideas and have fun with their writing. But at the same time, I want to show them that structure. Okay, so if you're going to be teaching writing, the other thing you need to be is doing is doing a grading of these papers. Um, and you're grading them based on, again, the product, interestingly enough. What do we want these things to look like? And there are a number of ways that you can do this. I would recommend a tiered uh, grading system, otherwise known as a rubric. Uh, and that's where you're grading a variety of elements within the paper. Um, so, for example, you can grade uh, the, the, uh, the flow of ideas. You can grade uh, the creativity. You can grade... Um, uh, how well the hook has been placed. You can grade. Uh, uh, you can grade surface errors. Uh, you can grade how well the writing components are in place. For example, do they have a thesis? Um, right. Uh, uh, that type of thing. So a variety of things that you can do when you're developing. Again, that's going to depend on what product you want to see um, at the end. But if you have that, then at least you can show students these are the things that I consider important in a paper. Um, and then you can uh, you can go forward with that. I would also recommend doing peer and teacher feedback. Why peer feedback? Um, for two reasons. One, it allows them to start focusing on what elements should I be uh, they should be looking for. Okay. A lot of times students don't even think about what are the things that I should be looking for. But when they're now required to go look for them, okay, in other words, pushed output production again, they have to read and then write. They have to read and then write. And so it's a very good way for them to start looking at the elements that they're supposed to have in their paper and they're supposed to identify in others. Second reason why peer feedback is good is because students can steal from others. I don't know if you've ever read somebody's paper and as you're reading it, you say, oh, that's a nice construction. I la I'm taking that. You're not taking their words, but you're taking the way they construct things. And so ESL students can use other people's stuff to help them enhance their writing. Um, and so that's a good thing. Peer feedback is going to allow them to read other people's papers and then learn from them. So that's going to be a good thing. Why teacher feedback? Generally speaking, students, e second language learners, prefer teacher feedback simply because they trust it more. There are some groups of people who don't. They think their teachers don't know what they're doing or they would rather get a... Uh, feedback from somebody else. That's going to be up to the, the individual. Generally speaking, though, the students feel more comfortable getting teacher feedback. Uh, which is better, oral or written? Look at that, there's a typo. Oral or written feedback? Um, that's going to depend usually on the learner. There are some people who prefer written feedback because they can review it over and over again. There are those that prefer the oral feedback because they get the added non-verbal non um, uh, communication um, and then writing conferences there are some gr people who prefer grading within a writing conference or I'm not necessarily using a rubric I'm just trying to guide the students to help them write a better paper well, what does that really mean is that there's some type of rubric that's in your head that you're going to try to convey to uh, to them and that's fine writing writing conferences are, are generally very positive they are also very time-consuming all right, uh, last thing here is, uh, one of the last things anyway, is talking about writing and technology. 
Uh, in the past, we wrote on paper, and then we wrote on typewriters, and then we wrote on electric typewriters, and now we're at uh, word processors. Actually, we're leaving uh, the standard computer-based word processors, and we're moving on to the higher ones. But anyway, let's look at some of the benefits of word processors. One is spell checking, which I would probably tell you to use. Um, for in many in many instances, uh, you'll get uh, better spelling if you do it that way. If you're looking at how to spell a word, you can also get uh, spelling from other modes. Uh, modes. You can do uh, grammar checkers. These are less reliable. Sometimes they ask you to make changes that don't need to be changed. Sometimes you they ask you to do changes that aren't wrong, but are preferred. For example, most uh, grammar checkers will flag passive sentences. Passive sentences are generally considered to be less desirable, uh, so you should write in uh, more active sentences, but there may be times where you deliberately want passive sentences, and so the grammar checker is going to be wrong because it's uh, not understanding that it's not, a, it's not a grammar error, it's a grammar preference. You can also use thesauruses, and they're available in word processors, and they're also available online. There are a number of things that you can get out of that, but in addition to this mode, which I believe we are leaving now, we're now heading down to uh, to web-based writing, uh, technology that allows you to teach and learn writing online, like a CMS, content management system, like eCollege, like uh, Moodle, like Blackboard, uh, places inside where you can actually do some writing online. Um, Moodle actually has a wonderful tool that is actually allows you to do rubrics inside, allows you to do peer reviewing inside. They're all gradable activities. Uh, I've not seen anything similar in any of the other content management systems. Uh, Google Docs, however, does have some uh, nice tools, and we'll take a look at one of those real quick. And then so does Zoho. Um, Zoho is another free system. This is what Google Docs will look like, and from here you can create a document, a presentation file, a spreadsheet. Uh, and all of these uh, different types of things. When you go in here, you'll see here's what a typical page looks like. You'll note that a lot of this does look like a word processor with all these tools up here. Uh, in addition to those, you have this wonderful share button. Whoops, missed that in there. You can share documents uh, with other people, which means you can have other people review your stuff. You can also have other people write with you. So if you're doing a group project, it's a great thing to have. Another nice thing in here is um, uh, are these extra tools. One in particular is, uh, where is this? Right here. I don't see it yet. You can't see it. It says C Revision History. And that allows you to go back and see things that have been done in the past and who wrote them and what they did. So, and that's a nice thing. You can take a document that's written here and then you can... Uh, Download it as a Word document or as an open office document. You can email it. You can publish it from right here. You can publish it to the web so that it's available for other people. Okay? Uh, so some of the nicest things here that you don't find in your typical Word processor is that you can share it on the web. I don't need a flash drive. I don't need to have it in any specific location because it's in the cloud. And I can as long as I can access the cloud, I can get to this file, right? And the revision history is another great tool. And then sharing. I can share with multiple people at the same time. There are some big benefits of using something like this. Some people are not thrilled with seeing Google run and control everything. And so, uh, and I would be one of them. And you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket regardless. So I would recommend that if you're interested that you start looking at this thing called Zoho Docs. It's very similar to Google Docs. It actually has more options within the, uh, the uh, tools that are there. Uh, can I? I forget if I've become a member here recently.